uh, to be so. Um, and if I could just also request again that people keep the micro uh, microphones off um, so we avoid any background noise. Um, so today's session is on the COVID-19 and influenza vaccination programme and our preparations for the coming winter. Um, it's actually, I think, 12 months on now since the first Derbyshire Dialogue session, and these were set up in response to the pandemic uh, to have a kind of two-way dialogue um, and keep people up to date with what's going on. So I suppose to mark the um, one year on, um, it, it's good for us to have a little look back and see what's going on, but also see where we're at now and what we're planning with winter coming. Um, so given the presentation today, we've got Dr. Stephen Lloyd, who's the medical director for NHS Derby, Derby and Derbyshire Clinical Commissioning Group. We've got Dr. Drew Smith, the clinical director, Derby City North Primary Care Network. And we've got Gavin Boyle, chief exec of University Hospitals of Derby and Burton NHS Foundation Trust. So, Thank you very much to each of the presenters uh, for agreeing to come along and present today. I'm going to hand it across to you now, Steve, if that's OK. Yeah, and thank you, Lee, and um, good morning, everyone, and, and thanks for, for joining the call. Um, so as Lee says, it's really just to look back um, in terms of where, we, where we're at with the vaccination programme in Derbyshire, um, just looking at some key elements of that and where is this going in the future so lee's kindly put together a presentation for for this and um, i'm notorious for running off piece off off these uh, presentations so bear with me um, and bear with me as well because i've got man flu this morning and unfortunately there's no vaccination available for that um, and i'd like to reassure colleagues it's certainly not covid so just coming on to the call, um, I was just thinking what to say about where we've been with this pandemic, um, how it's affected everyone, everybody's lives, and certainly the healthcare system in particular. And I know Gavin will be coming on to that in terms of where do we go with this in, in with the forthcoming winter, of which obviously there are a number of concerns. So when COVID came on the scene and it, it it seems like an eternity ago but actually in it's not that long ago is it um, and we'll all recognize uh, the landmarks that, um, that unfortunately descended upon the whole world um, with COVID-19 and certainly globally um, there was a period of obvious vulnerability um, to COVID in terms of treatments in terms of mitigations and the imposition of, of obviously um, infection control measures that we all um, um, you know took on board but vaccinations were really the key thing to get us out of this um, dreadful situation with regards to the pandemic and obviously worldwide pharmaceutical companies cooperated very closely in terms of data and data and data share about developing vaccines at pace. And certainly um, the vaccines that have been stood up um, have, have proven uh, wonderfully efficient in terms of um, getting a grip on this pandemic. And let's be clear, um, these vaccinations um, have been uh, developed very quickly, but and particularly for the so-called mRNA vaccines, these have been in development for a number of years based on, interestingly, the experience of SARS-CoV-1, uh, the SARS outbreak that took place in Southeast Asia um, some number of years ago. So there was a leg up, if you want to call it that, in terms of vaccines development and certainly one of the key milestones that you can see in front of you there was the the regulatory approval the mhra approval of the pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine colloquially known obviously as pfizer and closely followed by the astrazeneca vaccine which come on the scene at the same time now 
vaccinations programs of this scale don't just happen overnight and that's an obvious thing to say um, and I will say that as executive uh, senior responsible officer uh, for the COVID and flu vaccinations program on behalf of Derbyshire integrated care system. So prior to December the 2nd there was a huge amount of work undertaken at our county and city system level to put in place an infrastructure to deliver this vaccinations program and that was a very very busy uh, four months prior to the launch of the vaccination program um, this is a nationally commissioned program at a local level we have to coordinate and set up the infrastructure and manage the logistics and supply and all that sort of thing to make sure that the sites that are designated have all the requisite material to deliver uh, the vaccination and that includes the workforce element as well so the approach to this in the first instance was what infrastructure resource have we got to deliver this vaccination program so first the stand up was the so-called hospital hubs um, that, would, that took place at Chesterfield Royal Hospital Royal Derby Hospital, closely followed by Burton Hospital. And that was the first go live uh, in the first week of December. And that was a, a remarkable moment in time. It, it felt significant. Um, and the good work done by the hospitals in particular at that point in time is well recognised. Then there is an element of what can we set up in terms of the community and particularly I'm um, thinking of the general practice and primary care sites that um, people are familiar with now and in that picture we, we see um, Stubbley um, Medical Centre in Dromfield which was the first of the primary care sites to go live in Derbyshire and also um, setting up it's colloquially called a mass vaccination centre um, which we stood up at the Derby Arena in the city uh, alongside the primary care centre uh, for the city as well. So in the early days um, it was a very fast setup and a very fast understanding of the logistic requirement of this and coordinated through uh, what we call a vaccines operations centre which is hosted by uh, the clinical commissioning group. If you move on to the next slide, please, uh, Lee, that would be helpful. So the vaccinations, as I've said, very rapidly developed, very rapidly signed off, safely signed off, of course, and that's led by the regulators at national level and international level. And I think the thing to remember with these vaccines is that they're under, um, legally under what's called an emergency regulation. So there are constraints to how the vaccines are distributed and delivered across the whole of the, the Derbyshire patch. So folks often asked at that stage, why aren't they available in my local general practice? Um, but that, that is outside the regulations for that, outside the legal requirements for that degree of control and safe delivery of the vaccines to both the sites and to the public. And very quickly, we set up our infrastructure in Derbyshire to, to match that demand. Now, obviously, on a national level, this has been closely controlled and coordinated, both from national team, regional team, and our team, following very closely, and it, it was a legal requirement, to follow the guidance of the Joint Committee of Vaccinations and Immunisations, called JCVI. So at phase one of the program, as it was called, there were nine cohorts um, based on vulnerability, based on age, and um, those key workers in the system that um, um, were, were serving the general public. So phase one to nine was essentially the over 50s, and we had to deliver that roughly by, by the middle of, of March. And you see that timeline in front of you there, that closely follows that. Alongside that, concurrently, obviously we were bringing on other sites as well, um, pharmacy sites, 
to, to bolster that infrastructure and make sure that we're getting through at a, at a pace um, uh, the, the required uh, element of vaccinations. And the efforts in Derbyshire have been well recognised at uh, national level. So as you can see from, from that slide, the Prime Minister uh, kindly visited the Derby Arena to see a fantastic setup there, which was one of the biggest in the country. Um, as I said, a mass vaccination centre and a primary care led centre that were co-located at the arena. And also we received visits from Sir Simon Stevens, who at that time was chief exec of the of the NHS. So we moved at pace and, um, and moved very, very well on this. And um, it was a challenge and remains a challenge to all our clinicians and support staff in all those settings. But we, we really went at it and um, and certainly have delivered um, that, that element of the programme. Beyond March, it tipped into phase two, again following a, an age banding and um, also a significant amount of work about setting up what we call an inequalities group to look at um, where we can influence the uptake of vaccines in deprived communities and what was termed at that time hard to reach communities special elements within the within our communities and again you see on that timeline uh, the excellent work that uh, Dr Drew Smith uh, has undertaken for homeless people in Derby. Uh, next slide please Lee. And again we, we as you see on that trajectory there in front of you um, the, the efforts that we've put in to reach out into all our communities to deliver this vaccination program um, and obviously at that time, as we moved into what was called phase two, a um, number of elements that um, we had to, had to uh, deal with, um, particularly around supply from national level down to local level, and again, more efforts into moving the, the vaccines out into our communities. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. And what I'll what what I'll go through very quickly, if we can just get rid of that out of the way, um, is how we coordinate this and how we how we sort of overwatch this from a from a system perspective. So what you see in front of you there is is basically the reports that um, I um, look at with the with the senior leadership team on the program um, three times a week that comes through. Um, for our consideration and set out there are some of the headlines from this week basically. So at this point in time, we've delivered 1.54 million vaccinations, um, 793,000 of which are first doses. And I'd just like to just, folks, just to pause at that point and think about the numbers. They're quite big. Um, and this is a, a novel vaccination program um, across you know, the whole of the country, basically. And that just gives a, an idea of, of the scale of this and the complexity of this in delivering this across what are called those four pillars of delivery, hospital hubs, general practice through the primary care networks and uh, community pharmacy and the mass vaccination centre and the mobile teams that, that we've got to deliver this. And again, as I've said before, there have been significant challenges along the way in terms of supply, constraints on logistics, but equally, what, what's new in the in, in the pandemic? And we obviously we've we've encountered the Delta variant and uh, there was a significant amount of work to put together what's called an enhanced response into areas that um, at that time were experiencing significant Delta variant outbreaks. But at this point in time, um, we're at 1.54 million vaccines uh, delivered, and that gives a that, that second bullet point on there, so 3,000 vaccines completed uh, from Monday the 29th. Uh, just gives an idea of the old, the turnover, if you like, of, uh, of the vaccines being delivered. So the numbers are quite staggering, aren't they? And that graphic just gives the 
cohorts that we've worked to to this point in time. And you can see <clears throat> substantially the most vulnerable. And we've got very high figures of cohort penetration, both first doses and second doses. And for me personally, that's been absolutely important that we get the vaccines to the most vulnerable people, but on an equitable basis across both the county and the city and to those communities that are most deprived and challenged in, in accessing the vaccination. Currently, I'll come to this um, and shortly, the focus is on cohort 11 and 12 and trying to get into first doses for 30 to 39 year olds, 18 to 29 year olds, and the new addition to this in terms of 16 to 17 year olds and the 12 to 15 year olds. This has been, these have been very challenging cohorts, um, not just locally, but nationally. But the excellent progress I think we've made through our teams on this needs, needs flagging up. For example, 18 to 29 year olds, when we're nearly at 75% of our total population of that age group having received the first dose of vaccination. And that's that's really way in front of the national average, as all the cohorts have been uh, throughout this program. So that, that's significant progress indeed. And again, 16 to 17 year olds, what's colloquially called a very hesitant population. Um, we're at 63% first doses with those. And there's a lot of talk in the media about vaccine hesitancy. What this tells me is actually that's a minority. Um, the vast majority of people recognise the importance um, of vaccination, both for themselves personally and for their fellow man and woman, for their communities. And those figures, certainly from a Derbyshire perspective, to me give a great source of comfort because it tells me about the community spirit we have in our in our county and city that we look out for each other basically and recognize the importance of this not just on a personal level and obviously you know personal level includes those who are clinically extremely vulnerable but on a community level and the 12 to 15 year olds um this is where we're we've embarked over the last week in terms of this cohort so one of the things through the program has been the significant national ask of short notice to mobilise teams to address specific cohorts. And the 12 to 15 year olds is a good example of that. So we had the advisories from Joint Committee of Vaccinations and Immunisations to go forward into the 12 to 15 year olds. First of all, the clinically extremely vulnerable, which is obvious, um, so they'll need um, a first dose and a second dose of the Pfizer vaccination. So we quickly mobilise the team to look at how that would be addressed both in the county and a city level, and certainly utilising the good offices of uh, Derby Royal Infirmary to address clinically extremely vulnerable 12 to 15 year olds and in the county using our primary care sites. Then very quickly, the national guidance came through to expand that cohort of clinically extremely vulnerable 12 to 15 year olds. And again, a significant ask on the system to capture those individuals. Then, as colleagues are aware on the call, the national guidance was right 12 to 15 year olds, the healthy uh, individuals in that. We need a first dose um, to go out to, to those individuals. And very quickly, our teams have got on with that. And we're even in the space of a week, um, we've got to 13% of that population of students in educational settings. And that cohort, off the top of my head, is 49,500 students across um, both city and county. And what we're using for that, because this has been a directive from national level, is our school age immunisation teams uh, that go into schools on a normal basis to deliver immunisations. But the extra ask is now to do uh, the COVID vaccinations and I very quickly got a plan in place for that, for those teams to go out to schools on a plan basis and, um, 
and to deliver that vaccination. So again, very quick turnaround on this and quick mobilization of our teams to address that particular issue and we're on with it. And this isn't just about literally um, grabbing a bunch of people and say, go forth and vaccinate. Obviously, the logistics element of this, the vaccinations element of this is a significant ask as well. Um, but we manage it. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. And I'd just like to pay tribute, obviously, to the, the efforts from our primary care colleagues. Um, I think that deserves mention because phase one and phase two, um, some 75% of the delivery of this program has been through primary care led sites. And folks on the call will be familiar by now with their, with their local setups in terms of primary care. And what we do here on this dashboard is literally geographically map the population against the primary care networks that we've got in city and county. And that uh, is an important piece of monitoring <clears throat> for me personally to make sure that that equity bit is, ad is adhered to because I am absolutely keen that we are being I would say fair is the wrong word, but giving that offer out to all our communities and certainly those areas, um, particularly in the city um, that are struggling uh, to achieve that um, that cohort penetration. And you'll see on that slide there, there's one PCCO in Derby City that we support that primary care network with our inequalities team to reach out into the community through mobile sites and pop-up sites to deliver the vaccine. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. And inequalities, um, like I say, is, is very, very high on my um, list of importance. And we have a bespoke vaccines inequality team led by public health colleagues, by local authority colleagues, by CCG colleagues, and of course, um, our clinical colleagues to work through um, how we get into communities to deliver that vaccination and to give an offer of the vaccination utilizing not just um, you know a, a simple top-down approach but to generate a conversation in communities about the importance of uh, this vaccination program and i don't know if uh, dr drew smith is on the call yet um, Yes, I'm here, Steve. I just True. don't have a working camera, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> True. Do you want to? Would you? Would you like to talk through some of the some of the some of the stuff that um, that you've been leading on at this point? Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, so thanks very much, Steve. And as Steve said earlier, thank you for everybody um, joining us. I'm Drew Smith. I'm a clinical director of Derby City North Primary Care Network, and also work as a GP partner at Wilson Street Surgery and have led the COVID vaccination program for the Derby City General Practice Services, which is a combined population of almost 350,000 patients across 29 practices. Um, obviously, we have deprivation throughout Derby City and Derbyshire um, of varying degrees, and there are some specific challenges around deprivation. And as Steve said, there is uh, a specific vaccine inequalities group in order to tackle this. And there's various types of vaccine inequality. It may be that it is down to um, traveling population or homeless population as one specific group, um, or where we have groups where English is not the first language of the patient, or where you have differential educational quali uh, qualifications and where you may have uh, illiteracy even in patients who have got English as their first language. And we know prior to the COVID vaccination programme that uh, such issues as deprivation do lead to poorer uptake of public health initiatives, including vaccination, and that was reflected in the COVID vaccination programme. So the things that we have done is look at why there is vaccine hesitancy there, and that has been uh, an approach taken by various different system partners to engage with the, the the populations and try and explore this further, including outreaches to areas of employment, such as factories, which may be 
primarily an Eastern European workforce where, where vaccine uptake is known to be lower and amongst that population or telephone calls coming directly from practices known to be in greater areas of socioeconomic deprivation directly to patients to answer their questions. And there was a pilot project for that that led to an almost 50% increase in that population who had remained unvaccinated before. Um, it's also about, as, as the slide says, identifying misinformation, which led to hesitancy amongst um, BAME communities. And again, taking services out into those communities, so areas of Normanton and Derby City and, and, and hosting um, vaccination services in locations that may have been closer to the patient's home or in an environment where they felt more comfortable uh, and, and obviously being mindful of r religious and cultural beliefs about females, for example, being vaccinated by females and, and, and not having to undress in front of males and so on. And again, these were initiatives that, that Derby and Derbyshire led the way on um, regionally and that had had successful outcomes in increasing vaccine um, penetration across the cohorts. As I've already said, it, one of the greatest achievements of the vaccine programme in Derby and Derbyshire has been systems working together. Uh, that's from various areas of the healthcare service. And as we move forward beyond um, the pandemic and beyond vaccinations, there is a real strong feeling of continuing that forward. That secondary care, primary care providers, GP practices, the clinical commissioning group, uh, public health and vol the volunteer sector. And, and the volunteer sector shouldn't be undersold because they have been absolutely pivotal and delivering this vaccination programme. And I'm appreciative to the people who have provided um, positive statements to the success of the vaccination programme in the chat. Um, but the, 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 the volunteer workforce, this what we have achieved could undoubtedly not be achieved without them. Um, and, and again, as the slide says, we've, we've collaborated um, on, on that. And we take that forward into phase three of the vaccination programme but also into other areas of healthcare um, and, and social care delivery as we, as we move forward uh, and as an integrated system. If you could move on to the next slide, please, Lee. And, and again, things like community toolkits for, for, for conversation with, with, with people from different backgrounds. So this touches on what I've said on the, on the previous slide. So provision of information leaflets in a multitude of languages so that it can be understood because Obviously, as, as you'll appreciate, if you've had this sort of level of healthcare information or read the, the vaccination leaflets in your own language, if you were reading that information in a second language, well, you may have a grasp on it to hold a day-to-day -day conversation. The level of detail and complexity that's included in this information, it really does help to be delivered in your first language and a language in which you're confident so that you can understand it. And of course, then allow us as clinicians to be able to address concerns and questions that individuals may have in order to increase and maximise uptake. Um, and, 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 and again, having that on a format that is available to patients. So whether that's a, a printed out written document, whether that's available online, whether that's available and, and, and can be accessed on a mobile phone, because you have to adapt to how society access information, as I'm sure many of us are aware, um, younger people are more and more and more accessing things through their mobile phone rather, rather than things that come through the post or, or, or written documents. And again, we've done that as a, as a collective, which has led to us achieving what we what we have in, in this area. And the next slide, please, Lee. So, the, the, for example, in the city, so as I, as I said, having clinics that were delivered in an environment that was felt to be reassuring to the patients and in, in an area that they knew they felt comfortable in um, and was local to them. So the example here is in the Pakistani Community Centre in Normanton uh, in Derby City. And again, that, that was a collective approach done by various system partners. So it was done with... Um, it was it was done with uh, the community pharmacy um, and that area and also with CCG colleagues and, and also our colleagues and in, in, in DCHS as the lead provider for the vaccination service. It's given the term a pop up clinic 
uh, that can sometimes suggest it's a very temporary short-lived um, event. Some of the pop-ups have actually delivered huge amounts um, of vaccine and have been done on a repeated basis. And as Steve touched on earlier, um, what, one of the services that the GP practices in Derby City did was for the homeless population who, who have historically got low, low vaccine uptake, um, which was very successful and led to far greater vaccine uptake than we would have predicted um, from that pop-up clinic. It's reflecting on what is suitable for the population. So having clinics on a Friday in order to, to, to follow Friday prayers at the mosques and making the process as, as straightforward and efficient as we can for, for, for patients. And, and, and again, as is reflected in the chat, um, that that's obviously something that's been positively fed back about how successful the vaccination services across the whole county uh, um, have been in and doing in doing so, and, and there, you know, we've been overwhelmed by the positive support for that. And the next slide, please, Lee. And I think you wanted to come back on this part, didn't you, Steve? Yeah, thanks, Drew. And um, you know, that, that Drew just flagged up the excellent work that his team have done in, in the city. Um, so as we move forward, um, we're now entering what's colloquially called phase three. Um, it sounds neat, doesn't it? Phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, but as Winston Churchill once said, all things happen simultaneously. And I'll, I'll touch on this as, 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 I, as I carry on. So phase three, basically, colloquially known as the booster programme. And essentially, the boosters, um, as guided by Joint Committee of Vaccinations and Immunisations, are the, for those who are most vulnerable, who reached the six month trigger point to receive a booster dose of the vaccine, which predominantly going forward will be the Pfizer vaccine. So this has been neatly staged into two elements, stage one and stage two. And as you can see from, from the slide, it, again, it's based on that age cohort basis. And for those who are most vulnerable uh, from COVID infection, particularly the immunosuppressed and the clinically extremely vulnerable, and particularly those in care home settings, both residents and workers. And of course, the, the big uh, cohorts of health and social care workers who deliver care into our communities. So again, uh, what, what's the approach on this from planning and infrastructure perspective? And what are the constraints to delivering this this element of the programme as we go into the autumn. And I know Gavin will touch on um, the huge demands that are placed on the healthcare system, both currently and anticipated in the winter in terms of urgent care, restoration of NHS services, um, and the vaccination programme itself, which is a key priority for, for our system. So essentially, what we have to do is to adapt the infrastructure um, that I've described for phase one and phase two, um, but also cognizant of the fact that primary care, as always, our general practice colleagues are extraordinarily busy at this point in time. So adapting this infrastructure to deliver this element of the programme. So again, that familiar setup of local vaccination services led by general practice, community pharmacies, hospital hubs, and the mass vaccination centre but with a reconfiguration of this. So I said, phase one and phase two, 75% of the programme has been delivered through the primary care element. Cognizant of the pressures on general practice that we all recognise, the mix will be pulling down that 75% to around about 56% on a system basis, increasing the number of pharmacies available across our geographies, both in the city and county, to deliver this element of the programme into the community. And of course, the, the excellent work the hospital hubs are, are doing in terms of supporting the vaccination programme and focusing on, on health and social care workers. And of course, the mass vaccination centre, which has now been relocated in the city to, to Midlands House. So this programme, this element of the programme has, has started already. And as you can see, um, there is an age banding to this. And also, obviously, there will be a, a chronological banding on this because 
patients have to reach that six month mark before it triggers an invitation for for revaccination. Um, what's the total that we're looking at here? So overall, for this element of the program, we've got 15 weeks to deliver 1.1 million vaccinations. And I'll take you back to uh, the original slide on that situation report, which said we'd done 1.54 million vaccinations over a nine month period. So this is a significant compression of that program. That's not all COVID vaccination. This is where the flu element gets pulled into uh, the calculation as well. So it's a 50-50 split between flu and COVID revaccination. The COVID element still operating under emergency regulations. So again, constraints on that. The flu program, this is very well understood. Historically in Derbyshire, very well delivered by our general practice and community pharmacy colleagues in the main, with support from other trusts, such as the hospitals and uh, Derbyshire Community Health Services. And we will be adapting that flu, flu program as we go forward. But the bulk of the flu program will continue to be delivered in the familiar settings in general practice. There is the opportunity to um, deliver both flu and COVID vaccination at the same time. But essentially, it doesn't really matter as long as we get them, we get people vaccinated both for COVID and flu um, that are eligible for those vaccinations. So like I say, uh, 1.1 million vaccinations to deliver in that, um, in that limited envelope. What I've done is set the capacity for the system at 2.3 million vaccines and that equates to the capacity and ability to deliver 153,000 vaccines per week um, and that that redundant capacity if you want to call it that of around about sort of 49 50 percent is important because um, not just of the constraints in terms of and the workforce, because as I said, you know, there's a significant pull of the workforce into other areas of NHS and social care activity. And this is where the volunteer element of Drew rightly flagged up is so important, not just delivering the vaccinations, but the support for um, those clinical services. But also recognizing, like I say, phase one, phase two, phase three is, is, is not just little shut offs. Um, we don't close down phase two and move to phase three. We have got to continue second doses um, from the later elements of phase two. We've got to continue that. We've got to continue what's called the evergreen offer. Um, and that means for people for whatever reason um, didn't take the opportunity to have the COVID vaccination in phase one and phase two. We've got to cater capacity wise for the asks that have landed on us now in terms of, like I've described, 16 to 17 year olds, the, the 12 to 15 year olds, and also for those who are immunosuppressed, um, there is a, a third dose of their first vaccination elements. So normally it's first dose, second dose, and then move on to a booster at six months. The immunosuppressed, it's first dose, second dose, third dose, then a, a six month booster on, on top of that. So all that's going to be fed into the into the uh, considerations, if you will, uh, regarding this, this element of the programme. But I'm pleased to report um, we're on with it in terms of phase three sites and the excellent work continues from primary care and from our hospital hubs. And we will get a slow build up of community pharmacies to bolster the programme throughout all our geographies in the city and county. Next slide, please, Lee. Um, and that just touches on some of the elements that, um, that I've just talked through. Um, next slide, please. And I think that's where I'll take a breather, basically, um, and hand over to Gavin. Thanks, Steve. So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so my name's Gavin Boyle, and I'm the chief executive of the University Hospitals of Derby and Burton. But what I also do is uh, I'm the uh, I'm the lead for urgent and emergency care across Derbyshire. And 
interestingly, immediately before this meeting, I've, I've literally just left the urgent and emergency care board for Derbyshire, whose um, whose job is basically to to, to plan for winter. Uh, we've just spent some time this morning going through uh, some of the challenges we think uh, we'll face, but also some of our, our plans to, to to mitigate those those risks. And our our intention is to take um, the 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 winter plan for Derbyshire to the uh, the public. Uh, a meeting of the Joined Up Care Derbyshire Board towards the end of October. But in terms of, of um, this winter, I think Steve's touched on it. it. It feels like it's a winter potentially like no other. Um, you know, we've come through a, an incredibly intense 18 months period. We're all parts of the health and care system within Derbyshire have been under, under huge uh, strain, whether that's, you know, responding to COVID or whether that's uh, delivering uh, the vaccination program that we've just heard about. Um, so we've had a, a, an incredible kind of uh, period of time, which you know has taken its toll on people. Uh, and yes, uh, you know our job is to is to obviously to to rally our, our people and make sure that we're we're in a place to respond to what we anticipate will be an increased level of of demand. I think the other thing to to say is that the COVID hasn't gone away. Uh, I think it's it's uh, you know you, in in general life you can see that the restrictions have been been relaxed because of the success of vaccination but you know in in the in the healthcare system uh, covid still feels like uh, it's very much uh, uh, with us uh, i think the the other thing to say is um you know through the pandemic we also accrued backlogs of planned care where we we t- we took decisions uh, not to bring um patients who um uh, who who are of a lower acuity into the hospital environment for safety reasons, but what that's meant is uh, that there are now backlogs of elective care. So not only do we need to manage uh, winter and COVID and the, the the increased pressures that we anticipate, we've also got uh, to try and maintain our efforts to uh, to deliver uh, uh, the uh, recovery from that that backlog because we know. You know, it's easy to, to refer to, to patients waiting as as routine procedures, but if it's you who's waiting, it doesn't feel routine. And I think that weighs very heavily on our mind. And I, I think the the final thing to say is, um, you know, the, 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 there are other challenges that we face. So, um, you know, we'll touch on a flu and the flu vaccination program, but uh, we're also seeing high levels of respiratory illness, not COVID related in, in children. So it does feel like a, um, you know, a very, a very um, challenging period. Um, so, I mean, onto the winter plan, um, you, you know, g- given, given that, I mean, I, I guess what we're trying to um, address in this is one being ready for a resurgence of COVID-19 cases. And, you know, interestingly, over the last uh, few weeks, probably for the first time, we've seen significant increases in uh, um, secondary school aged children uh, actually coming and needing uh, uh, support within the hospitals, but also uh, uh, approaching uh, primary care. So, um, you know, we, we need to keep focused on, on COVID. Uh, we need to deliver the, um, you know, the, the 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 third wave of the vaccination program, the the kind of booster uh, vaccinations. We need to protect capacity within uh, within the hospitals to enable our our service recovery. And I think we've made good progress in terms of uh, patients waiting for for cancer care. Um, but similarly, we're seeing big demand in terms of uh, patients coming through us potentially with with cancer. So uh, uh, we've got high demand, but we're making good progress. Uh, and of course, we need to uh, make progress against some of those backlogs. And you know, just to give you a bit of a statistic, I think at the end of March, um, we had um, over ten and a half thousand patients waiting longer than a year for for treatment for for routine uh, procedures. Uh, needless to say, before the pandemic, we you know people didn't wait anything like that uh, length of time. We had nobody waiting over a year, but uh, ten and a half thousand at the end of March. Pleased to say that's around six thousand now. So we've been able to make some inroads, but it's a long haul, and we've still got a long way to go. And what often happens in the hospital environment is when we get high levels of uh, emergency demand, uh, it's sometimes we we have to rein back on the planned work to accommodate that. Well, this year we we really want to avoid avoid that if we possibly can. I've mentioned staffing, but that is a challenge um, because, uh, you know, clearly staff have been through a very challenging period. And, you know, if you take uh, operating theatre, for example, the, the very staff that we we use to uh, increase our critical care capacity during the pandemic are actually our theatre staff. 
And now they're the very people that were heavily reliant on to help us with our, our recovery. So the staffing challenge is going to be a big part of our plan, uh, maintaining patient flow throughout the pathway. So not just in hospitals, but in our community beds and in our our um, you know local local authority pathways, whether that's um, you know care packages in people's homes or or residential and nursing home beds, maintaining that flow through the system so that we keep um, capacity available at the front end for the next emergency patients coming along is going to be uh, really key. And um, you know uh, just like every other part of the system, primary care has been under huge pressure not only responding to increased demand, but also, as Steve has just described, delivering the vaccination program. Uh, uh, but also, um, you know, primary care will come under pressure during during the next few months, I think, particularly. So looking at how we um, uh, work together as a, as, a, as, a, as a system, and particularly how primary care colleagues pull together, as they have done so well, in terms of uh, the, the the pandemic and the, the delivery of the vaccination program, it's going to be really key, particularly in terms of responding to emergency or or, or, or the the urgent demand for urgent care, um, uh, whether that's um, face to face contacts or or telephone or, or home visiting, is going to be a, a, a big a big priority. Um, just the ne next slide, please. So I, I've kind of in this slide we sort of put out you know some of the um, the particular areas of focus in the winter plan um but the uh, uh the, you know the objective is there in the shaded shaded box but there are kind of six themes uh that we've described there that we're focusing on so some of the things i've talked about primary care um you know clearly you know an important part of the plan enhancing uh, emergency access to mental health services is is also going to be critical um particularly strengthening services for for older adults because uh, we know that um uh, you know, older older people within our community are are more vulnerable at this time of year, um, not just from COVID, but from flu and other uh, you know seasonally related uh, illnesses, just general respiratory illnesses, amongst other things. Um, supporting uh, um, our ambulance uh, service colleagues to to make sure that um, you know we're 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 obviously able to offload um, uh, patients uh, rapidly. Uh, when they're brought to uh, to uh, the emergency departments to to ensure that those ambulance crews can be back on the road uh, uh, to meet the uh, the next call, but also uh, the ambulance services are are, are developing a, a range of approaches to to try to avoid uh, bringing uh, patients to to hospital. Uh, but they're not alone in that. Some of the um, the really innovative work we've done around services such as Team Up uh, Derbyshire, which is a, an integrated. Uh, emergency health and social care response uh, to, uh, to to people in their own homes um, uh, aimed at avoiding conveyance to hospital and then uh, admission to hospital, which uh, is uh, really good news for, for 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 patients, but actually helps to maintain uh, the availability of capacity within the uh, the acute uh, trusts. Um, we're also looking within the hospitals themselves. How do we improve uh, the way that we work? Um, so uh, same day emergency care is a big focus at Chesterfield and, and Royal Derby and Burton. And what that means is if somebody presents to A&E, they need some specialist care. But rather than admitting them for that, can we provide that on the day, um, um, you know, close to the front door, but outside of the A&E uh, environment, but, but particularly focused on avoiding an admission? Um, and then and then I've mentioned the, uh, the work we're doing across the wider uh, care system. Uh, I chaired a, a, a meeting yesterday with um, leaders from the, the county council and city council, as well as health colleagues, looking at what we can do to increase the effectiveness of our um, uh, out of um, sort of our, our, our care response to enable discharge from hospital, but also step up to avoid admissions as well. I think we're I think we're very strong on this in, in Derbyshire, both the city and the county. I think we've got incredibly close uh, working relationships, but there are some real challenges, particularly around workforce uh, and the availability of people to work in the care sector uh, to deliver the services that, that we need. Um, ne next slide, please. Um, so. I probably picked on this, but in terms of some of the key focuses in that plan, um, you know, looking at our, our 111 service to, to make sure that it's, um, 
you know, it's as effective as it possibly can be. Again, I think we've got a strong uh, 111 service in Derbyshire provided by DHU, uh, making sure that there's um, directly bookable capacity, both um, uh, in terms of 111 into primary care, but also primary care into, into hot clinics, you know, acute clinics within the hospital, but also um, uh, potentially accessing the urgent treatment centres that we've set up both in Chesterfield and, and, and Derby, co-located uh, with the ED. Um, so I kind of won't go through everything there, I'm conscious of time, but uh, I sort of listed in that slide some of the key areas of focus. So next slide, please. I think communication is going to be key. Um, uh, so uh, there'll be kind of localised campaigns um, about, um, you know, um, encouraging uh, the public to choose wisely this winter and, you know, kind of um, make good use of, uh, you know, services such as, you know, their local pharmacy, but also accessing NHS 111 rather than uh, presenting uh, directly to uh, to ED. We are working with um, with with 111, both in Chesterfield, Derby and Burton, um, to, to, to test a, a different way of working, perhaps in terms of self-presentation at EDs um, this winter, where we would um, support um, people who are self-presenting -present to work through an algorithm to either book them into an alternative um, uh, um, uh, kind of a uh, place of treatment or, or to, to obviously to bring them into the ED or to the urgent treatment centre or perhaps to book appointments uh, at primary care, in primary care, etc. So just to make it a really simple service that tries to minimise uh, um, the emergency department attendances if we can possibly do that. But we will be encouraging people clearly to access services like 111. So um, a lot of focus on communication. There will be national campaigns as well. So we'll uh, obviously get... get uh, uh, on the back of those as well in in Derbyshire, but that that message of choosing wisely, I think, is going to be absolutely uh, key. Um, just moving on to, to to the to the next slide, I think I think this is probably my last slide, which is uh, again just on on winter planning. Um, you know, flu vaccination uh, and and uh, and the COVID booster really really important. So it's worth saying that I mean, clearly, I, I work in a in a in the hospital part of the system, uh, and uh, you know, we 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 do see. Um, you know, um, you know, we've still got significant numbers, 40 to 50 patients today uh, within 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 my hospitals. And, um, you know, a significant proportion of those patients are unvaccinated. But I think what I, I would say is a significant proportion of the patients who are really unwell, the ones that are in our critical care units and high dependency units tend to be the unvaccinated patients. So, you know, there's, there's you know, a, vac a vaccination is not a guarantee that you won't get the illness. I mean, it protects you against the illness. But it, but it does mean that you're much li less likely to, to require a, a stay in hospital or become critically unwell as well. So, uh, you know, the vaccine, you know, the boost is really important and flu as well. Um, you know, we had a relatively light flu season last year, I think because of social distancing and the uh, the precautions we had in place for COVID. But 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 clearly that's less uh, it's less evident in the community now. So I think we're we're expecting challenges around um flu this year so if you get you know you get you will get the opportunity to have your, your flu jab make sure make sure that you you do that um I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna leave it there lee and uh um kind of hand, hand back over to you and questions brilliant thank you thank you very much for that gavin and steve and andrew as well um so i'm just gonna come off sharing the screen now and there was a lot of information there that we've got through, but I think it in part just goes to show what's gone on in the past, nearly over over the past year. So um, a lot's gone on um, where we're at now and what we're looking at coming into the winter. So I think if we can quickly uh, get some of the key questions in, maybe from the chat box. I don't know, Karen, if there were any kind of key issues coming through there that we could look at that we could perhaps put to the presenters. I've got I've got uh, four really. Uh, so Ian Hardy, who's a volunteer steward, says, "Is there any explanation for large periods of time when nobody turns up at the vaccination centres?" That'd be you, Steve. Um, yeah, it's it's very. This is where it gets very difficult, isn't it? Because. Phase one and phase two, obviously very busy in terms of numbers coming through. 
and there's a natural tail off as we move towards the end of phase two. And again, as I've described with phase three, we're just at the outset of this now. And just bear in mind the time periods between second doses and boosters, six months. So we're just tipping into that phase now where people can come forward to the centres themselves. But equally, there's a, there will be activity now as teams go out to address the vaccinations element for those in care home settings, basically, and also uh, through our hospital colleagues, uh, which include Derbyshire Healthcare Foundation Trust in terms of NHS and social care staff. So you'll see a slow build up of this now uh, over the next couple of weeks, and that's factored into the capacity plan that we have. But okay. yes, at this point in time, it can feel quite patchy, I have to say. Okay, thanks. And um, then I've got Andrew says, um, I think in your data, it must have said that 112 to 15 year olds have already had their second jab. But he's questioning that, that, you know, the rollout started on September the 22nd. So what is the gap then between the first yeah, jab? Yeah, I recognise those figures can be slightly misleading in terms of the national data that we've given. So in phase one and phase two, and just be aware that uh, JC guidance was somewhat loose at that point in time, and there were a number of young people who had, who for good reasons, were clinically extremely vulnerable in particular, and household members of adult immunosuppressed patients um, that received the vaccination. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Um, what's the next question, please, Karen? The next one is, do we have any data specific for people with a learning disability in, in regards to their uptake and have there been reasonable, reasonable adjustments made for this group? Yes, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to feedback. It's not in, in, in the slide pack there, but that is some of the surveillance that I require my teams to do is look at specific uh, groups, um, particularly learning disabilities and Derbyshire Healthcare Foundation Trust has led the way in, in terms of learning disability um, cohort uh, vaccination uptake. And off the top of my head, I think we've achieved some 97% of um, that cohort at first dose. And that work obviously continues. Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to check Peter, a hand came up uh, from Peter. Is that in relation to the, the question asked then, or is that a separate question? Yeah, hi, Lee. No, I've got a separate question, but, you know, um, give me a call when I, I'm in a position. Yeah, yeah. I just want to hop in with that one then now quickly and we'll finish on the, I think we might have to finish on Karen's fourth one from the chat box. OK, thank you. Just very quickly, my name is Pete Steedman. I'm a public governor at UHDB. Um, I'd like to ask a question um, primarily to Drew, uh, I would imagine. And Drew, are there any learning points that we've actually established from reaching out to minority groups as as part of the vaccination program that we can specifically take forward when we actually go about delivering an integrated care system um, across Derbyshire going forward? Uh, yeah, Peter, I think absolutely there is. And, and actually, you know, as, as Gavin said, we, in meetings prior to this that feed into this sort of thing, I was actually just discussing this very matter with some CCG colleagues about how we level up based on what the additional requirements are for the patients. And we need to do this across the entire system. It needs to be done by all, all system partners, so the acute trusts, um, DHU, the CCG, community pharmacies, general practice. And it's about what are the specific barriers to access in various aspects of healthcare whether that be vaccinations or cancer screening services. Um, as two examples, how do you assess what the barriers are to that in those populations and how do you resource, and, and, and resource doesn't, it often is bashed as finance, it doesn't just mean finance, it means workforce and it means the right workforce. So again, the communication thing comes up. Um, you know, we've already discussed learning disabilities. So, so one of the things that, that I, I spoke about when, when the slides were up for me was how complex the information regarding vaccines should be. So one of the key things for learning disabilities was ensuring that that communication was understandable. 
Uh, and that also goes for, for, for patients with who don't speak English as their first language and how we assess that baseline and make sure that as a system, we can take that learning forward and, and resource it so that we can level up for these areas of deprivation. And I think the, the positive progress from the COVID vaccination service, if, if positive things are going to come out of this pandemic, it is a greater understanding of things like that and system partnerships that have addressed that. Um, as, as Steve brought up in his slides, the uptake in vaccination for the homeless population was double what we would have anticipated it to be. That's how successful it was. And, and, and that is absolutely fantastic. And that learning will not be lost as we then go into subsequent flu vaccination clinics. We will take that learning with us to try and continue that enhancement rather than park it as an issue only for the COVID vaccinations. Does that answer your question, Peter? Yeah, absolutely. And it's fantastic to hear that obviously the learning that we've accrued over the last 18 months, you know, won't be just purely aimed at the vaccination program going forward, you know, it will be established and embedded in in systems thinking, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the time uh, and years to come. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, just to add to that, Peter, the, you know, for me, one of the key jolts was the publication of the Public Health England paper last year, very early in the pandemic, pandemic about the disparities of outcome of COVID-19, which really flagged up really clearly um, the, the amount of work that needs to be done on inequalities and from a strategic system planning perspective in the IC, in the integrated care system that we've really seized on that and what Drew has described and others really gives them um, a level of comfort that we're really learning the lessons from this program to take into other planning and operational areas. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and I'm just mindful we're eking over on the time, but if we can just grab that one last question that Karen had from the chat box, and then um, just to remind everybody that we will take any questions that haven't been answered, we'll download them and we'll circulate them along with the recording of the session. So final question, thank you, Karen. Um, so this one's from Stella. I think it's quite an important one. It's a bit of the, about the confusion between the booster and the third vaccination and there's concern that, um, you know, the third vaccination might not get logged as that, uh, might get logged as a booster and then people might not get offered the booster in six months time. So do you want to come back in on that, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it can be quite confusing. Um, there is a specific cohort of people um, classified as immunosuppressed and those that tend to be people on uh, what's called biologic agents and, and others um, for a number of conditions. Um, the one that springs to my mind is, is rheumatoid arthritis, for example. So the thinking from JCVI is these are a specific cohort of people that require three doses of vaccine for their first primary course and then will be offered six months booster. Now that will be logged on systems, GP systems specifically as three doses, then a catch up six month booster. And certainly primary care colleagues and secondary care colleagues are very much aware of that and sharing data and identifying that cohort of people and it will be logged robustly, I think, on, on healthcare systems for the future. And that leads into the thinking, actually, what does phase four look like? Because there will be a phase four on that. And I've already directed my teams to start thinking around the modelling on that. OK, thank you very much. Well, thank you to everyone um, that's come along today. Thank you specifically as well to the presenters. Um, it was a bit of a jam packed session today. We've covered a lot, but yes, we will circulate the slides. They can be shared publicly um, and the key messages within them. Um, I'll as again, I will we'll pick up any questions that haven't been answered. Um, so I'm going to bring the session to an end, just mindful of the time and thank you for coming. Thank you.
Are you okay to stop the recording? It's how do I do that? Um, oh, it's okay. I can do it. Oh, wait, oh, I've got it. I've got it.